dreams and machines. What's the correlation? Is this a new form of IP fusing magic and tech like Gundam mechs? Not quite. In fact, I'm not really sure where the dreaming aspect comes into play here, but regardless, this is Modifius Entertainment's fresh new IP that draws a lot of similarities to Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a review of Dreams and Machines, the starter set. Let's dive in. So here we have the back of the box for Dreams and Machine. This was created by Chris Birch and copyright is 2023 and of course published by Modifius Entertainment. Something is waking on Evera Prime. Begin your adventure in Dreams and Machines. Dreams and Machines collide in a far future where its people come together to rebuild the ultimate tale of hope and heroism in the shadows of the Wakers. As the danger grows and the world once more is under threat, do you dare to dream? A vast distance from Earth, a human colony bearing the scars of a self-inflicted apocalypse survives on the distant world of Evera Prime. In the shadows of ruined megacities, humanity rebuilds, scavenging technology from the old world and returning to a simpler way of life. Among the mountains and valleys of New Mosgrove, the mechs of the old world dot the landscape, the deadly tools of a corrupt AI. Since the war that finally defeated the machines, they have been locked in the slumber that's lasted hundreds of years, but occasionally, they awaken, and when they do, these wakers continue their programming to wreak havoc across the world. So what comes in the box? We have the tutorial booklet, we have the adventure booklet, we have the rules reference booklet, there's a pack of five pink 20-sided dice, we have 154 tokens for metacurrencies and NPC standees, there's 42 player character cards, we have 26 equipment cards, 52 NPC cards, 31 illustrated location cards, 7 reference cards, 13 knowledge fragment handouts. We have 7 character envelopes. It's quite a bit that comes with the box. Let's start with the tutorial booklet. The tutorial booklet begins with some beautiful illustrations with some brief information about the setting. The default setting is Evera Prime, which was cut off from Earth long ago. There was a war against corrupted AI that controlled an army of mechs which resulted in the destruction of civilization. Many years later, the remnants of human society began to rebuild. There are people who shun the technology and those who embrace it. However, there are still remnants of the machine army sleeping all throughout Evera Prime and they could wake up at any notice. To me, this is straight up Horizon Zero Dawn, but without the plot twist. Character creation is done by combining the origin and archetype cards together. There are five origins to choose from. There's two Everin cards, a Dreamer, an Archivist, a River, and the Spear. And these will provide your characters with attributes. There are six attributes, and the attributes have ratings from 6 to 16. We have Might, which represents a character's physical strength and endurance. Quickness, which represents a character's coordination and speed. Insight, which represents a character's understanding and how to apply knowledge. Resolve, which represents a character's ability to remain focused or to command attention. Spirit, which represents a character's drive, stamina, and luck. Spirit can push a character past their normal limits to achieve heroic feats and can also be used to resist consequences to or avoid injuries. Crucially, players can also spend spirit points to add dice to their rolls or re-roll dice. There's also tech level, which describes the level of technology the character understands and can operate. Characters can't use equipment with a tech level above their own. So the origin cards will actually have those attributes statted for you. They'll give you your starting gear, and then you get to choose an archetype. And each of the origins, you're going to choose one of the two archetypes listed. There's five different archetypes to choose from. There's the mediator, the gatherer, the guardian, the grabber, and the tech. And these will actually provide you with your character skills. Uh, for example, we have the tech here who's got a fight of one, a move of two, an operate of four, sneak two, study three, survive one, talk two. Those may seem like low skills, but the thing about it is whenever you roll your 2d20s for a skill check, you're actually uh, looking at your attributes. You're trying to roll under your attributes. If you somehow manage to roll under your skill, that counts as an extra success. So think of skills as being bonuses 
in that regard. In addition to that, each archetype can pick one of the four talents listed for them, although you're going to have to check the card itself to see uh, which archetypes it goes with. And then, last but not least, you're going to pick a temperament. Uh, these are suggestions on how to roleplay that character, but it also tells you what happens mechanically when you're exhausted. So, for example, we have the temperament demonstrative. When your spirit reaches zero, you automatically fail on all insight tests and add plus one difficulty to all other tests. The exhaustion is called confused. And then from this point on, we actually get to a guided tutorial. You'll go through each scene and choose a character that would match it. For the out from the rubble scene, you'll choose up to two characters who have either the Everin Dreamer or River Origins. For these scenes, you might have a choice to make, but you will also have to roll regardless of what you choose. What to roll is given to you, so you don't have to think too much about it, at least right now. For the first test, players will take a might plus a move test. I really like how this is explained here. It's simple and it tells me everything I need to know about rolling under skills, which can be a li little bit confusing at first. For example, both players roll 2d20. Every die that rolled equal to or under the character's might scores one success. Each die that rolls equal to or under the character's move score scores another success. Count up the successes. This test has a difficulty of one, meaning each character needs at least one success to pass. If they do, then you can read the following. So, boom, that tells me everything that I need right then and there. This adventure begins with the starting settlement coming under attack from a mysterious cult-like group. The characters go through their respective scenes, claiming any equipment that they may come across. And once the PCs go through their scenes, they meet up and decide what to do next. They can explore the inside of the farmstead, or they can explore outside. And this is where location cards come into play. Each location card describes the location, that, uh, which is what you're going to read to your players, and provides you with some possible actions along with the skill test associated with it. And it should be mentioned here that um, there are possible actions listed for every location card, which it does seem very limiting, but you can always remind your players that you don't have to do the actions there. You could think outside the card and do your own thing if you so want. So definitely don't make it seem like it's board gamey or just, you know, you're limited to these actions on the card that they can do other things as well. After the players investigate the scene for evidence as to who their attackers are, they are given another choice, a very important choice. They can take the survivors to New Moss Grove, which is the main settlement of the area, or they can follow the tracks on their own. And then this adventure will conclude in the next booklet. This is a very interesting setup to the adventure. This is something that you might expect to play through in a Session Zero type of... Uh, of a meeting with your players to really get all the characters set up. I really like the progression of mechanics here. You don't start off with everything right off the bat. It's progressive. You start with skill tests and then you add momentum and things like that. And it just keeps on going until the end of the book. I should mention that you're not going to get all of the rules in this tutorial, just the core rules. And let's be honest, there's a lot of different mechanics in these 2d20 games by Modiphius, so that's kind of a blessing in disguise. Momentum results in any extra successes above the difficulty number. So like, for example, if you roll a 2 when you needed to roll 1, that means you would have a momentum of 1, because the 1 is extra. Spirit is essentially the other meta currency of the game, or probably the biggest meta currency of the game, and you use this to add like an extra d20, you can, but remember, you can only roll a maximum of five d20s for any skill test. You can use spirit to re-roll a d20. You can use a spirit to avoid an injury. And this is very interesting because it turns spirit into a pseudo health pool. It should be noted that if a PC suffers an injury, then they are defeated. That means they can't make any actions in the scene. Exhaustion also comes into play when a PC runs out of spirit and there are four different temperaments which are described on the temperament cards. The rules reference booklet fully explains these rules and then some, so it's going to be useful to have around. And even for the tutorial, I would say definitely make use of this, but most of the applications won't be as useful until you actually come into play with them in the adventure booklet. So let's take a look at that. 
The adventure booklet is kind of a strange one to me. In the tutorial, the PCs are given a choice. Either take the survivors to New Mosgrove or follow the tracks of the attackers. Following the attackers takes you straight to when the city is under attack. And this can be very brutal if the PCs have not had the time to rest and they will be wholly unprepared. You see, if the PCs go to New Mosgrove, they can undergo some quests before the attack happens, which means they can get better gear and they have time to rest up and things like that. The attack itself is used as the inciting incident for the end game. So you can basically do some stuff, extra stuff, or you can skip right up to the end game. So let's assume that the PCs chose to go to New Mosgrove. There are a few different locations to explore. You have the Wayhouse where the PCs can learn information, rest and find jobs. There's the docks where PCs can trade for supplies and also find jobs. There's Coral's house where PCs can train and find jobs. And then the new Mosgrove files where PCs can trade information and, can you guess, find jobs. PCs will explore around town, interact with NPCs and gain jobs. That's pretty much it for this part of the adventure book. The quests themselves don't really move the plot forward. It's more about exploring the world and learning about the NPCs and more importantly, gaining new loot. There are three quests PCs can take before the new Mosgrove is attacked. Old World Housing Complex has the group explore an abandoned villa to retrieve knowledge fragments. Knowledge fragments are this game's kind of currency that can be traded for coins, supply points, and even equipment. This one is pretty straightforward and a good starting point for any players who are newer to role-playing games. In the medical lab, PCs salvage tech for coin and search for the missing Grabber Twins. The Grabber Twins are kids who set off on this really sweet-ass vehicle to scavenge for supplies. They end up stuck in the medical labs. The PCs can rescue them, but will require some thinking as the place floods and they will have control over which uh, areas flood first. In Dreamer's community, the PCs learn more about Dreamer culture and ways to defeat the growing threat. This is an escort mission made even more annoying by the fact that the PCs have to guard two NPCs who are always at odds with each other. Um, basically, you have to choose one or the other and the other one will get mad at you and yeah, it's... Kind of dumb, in my opinion. <laughs> Once the PCs go on some of the quests and come back to New Mosgrove, they discover that it is under attack by a Waker, which is a giant mech. This is actually a really cool battle where the mech can destroy some of the locations in New Mosgrove if the PCs are not careful. After the PCs stop the attack, they follow the trail of the Thralls, which are the cult-like people who are attacking settlements with mechs. What follows is a sort of a dungeon crawl through a manufacturing building occupied by the Thralls PCs will have to navigate through the Nanographic Pavilion, the Lower Level, the Ruin Tower, and the Repair Bay. Each area has their own gimmick. For example, the Lower Level has this like hide-and-seek sort of a mechanic where there's mechs that are constantly patrolling the tunnels. If you get spotted, then they start uh, looking through each area until they uh, end up in the same area that you're in, and then it's bad news bears. When the PCs get to the Repair Bay, they discover the leader who is trying to wake an army of mechs. The boss fight ensues and the PCs either win or they die. The presentation for the books is spot on, especially in the tutorial booklet where the illustrations and the short lore bits, I love that. The art is very interesting and it does give me that Horizon Zero Dawn a feeling. Some of the characters are decked out in tech while others are decked out in furs. And you can definitely see that there are cultural differences between the two. The layout for the tutorial booklet is excellent. It's organized and easy to read through. The rulings are easy to find and also easy to read through. And as I stated before, a lot of the mechanics are explained in a very coherent way where I understand it the first time. I don't have to reread through anything like in some of the other core 2D20 rule books that I've read through. The rules reference is just a big glossary, so it's really hard to criticize something that is so essential. But the adventure booklet is where things get a little bit messy for me, and that's because it's not very consistent. For example, when a scene starts, you'd expect to see the components that you're going to use, the NPC cards, the location cards, the handouts, etc. That's not the case for every scene. It seems like you only get the components list for when it involves at least two locations or two NPCs, but all the scenes use these components in some way. 
For example, you have the scene three, which is the medical labs. You don't really get the components list here, but later on in some of the bigger scenes, like Dreamer's Community, you do. Also, I'm not really a big fan of starting scenes on the same page where one ends. I like there to be a bit of a clear definitive start for these sorts of sections, although that would make the booklet a little bit longer so I can see why it was done this way. There's only one map in the starter set and that is for the lower levels, but then again, it is very specific as to which of the locations uh, connect with each other and it's a cat and mouse game, so um, that's to be expected. It's, this map is basically just a placeholder for the cards themselves. I'm really glad they included components for things like momentum and spirit and inventory points, I think they're called. But then again, that's probably because there's actually no character sheets in the starter set. Players are given a couple of cards as their characters, so these components are absolutely necessary. By the way, there are character sheets, they're just not in the starter set. So you could print off those character sheets and then write all the stats on those if you want, but I actually really do like the cards themselves. Plus, they do give you envelopes to put the cards in, so you can basically save your game and continue at a different time. When I go into these pre-orders or these Kickstarters, I don't go all into the research. I like to be surprised when I can. I knew the gist of what I was getting into when I did pre-order this, but still, somewhere in my head, I thought that there was going to be magic involved. I mean, dreams and machines. This is not the case here. But I was still pleasantly surprised. I mean, this is literally Horizon Zero Dawn as a tabletop role-playing game, and I am all for that. The components in this game, from the cards to the cutouts, they're all high quality. The booklets are staple-bound and not glue-bound like the ones that we've been getting from Free League, which actually come apart very easily, by the way. So that's also a big plus. When I play this with my gaming group, I would play this with my winter group, the friends that I have that always visit me during the Christmas season and we, I always run a game for them. Those friends actually really love Horizon, the Horizon games, and I think this would be a good fit for them. However, I find that Modifius's 2D20 games are a bit complex. However, however, I think that the starter set does an excellent job at explaining and integrating the rules in a progressive manner to where it's not just going to be information overload. Whereas I know that when I read through the 2D20 core rules for like Fallout and Dune and Conan especially, the rules are kind of overbearing and there's a lot of explanation that goes into each of the rulings and it kind of gets confusing very quickly. I do think that you have to be fairly invested in the setting itself or the premise to really get the most out of this game. Anyways, that's going to do it for this video. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series and I will see you guys in the next video.